Over the years, we have been building schools where they were not. We have been extending schools where they exist. And we have been rehabbing schools where they are run down. And many of them were indeed run down buildings. I do recall all of that. So that you go into any villages, even the most remote of villages, Paramita, and you will see a significant, a more than significant number of the children in school. I do recall also that young people, a significant number of our young people who were able to go through the school system have themselves gone on to further training so that they have become teachers and have returned to the region to serve. So that today, today, more than 60% of the teachers in schools in Region 1 are from the very communities. And indeed, a significant number of the heads of those schools are from the very communities also. I recall with pride, I recall with pride that the regional education officer, the district education officers are from Region 1. And when you look at what was in 1978 when I did, for the first time, go to Region 1, none of these officers hailed from the region. And therefore, I emphasize the point that all of this was possible because significant attention and resources was given to education because we always knew as a party, as a government, that education was very, very important to bring in improvement in the lives of people, to reduce and ultimately removing poverty. Poverty Education was very, very important. Today, we have a scenario in Region 1 where all of the key players in education hail from that region. In the heads of the school hail from that region where a significant number of the teachers are trained and hail from the region, and very, very important also, where more and more of the children of school age do attend school. I'm happy to know that Budget 2012 allowed us to construct a new school in a new community, a newly established community called Powaipuri. I'm happy to know that Budget 2012 allowed us make available to the school children school uniforms, juices, biscuits, exercise and textbooks. I'm happy to report that Budget 2012 has learned them to access the learning, guided learning channel. I'm happy to report that Budget 2012 allowed them to establish learning resource centers, some new areas, like Walnut Village, for example and that we were able to procure some additional outboard engines which made it possible to move children in the riverine areas of Aruka and Waini and move them so that they can get secondary education. I'm happy to report also that the 2013 budget allows us to extend what we have been doing so that during 2013, additional schools will be built, additional teachers' quarters will be built, additional teachers will be trained. In other words, additional resources for improvement of education will be made available in Region 1, in all the various sub-regions. Mr. Chairman, if I touch a bit on health care, Region 1 has 41 health posts, 3 health centers, 3 cottage or district hospitals, 1 regional hospital. This is the extent to which we have improved over the years. I do recall, I do recall that in 78, there was only the Maruma Hospital, there was the Kaituma Hospital, there was the Matusket Hospital. But I do recall 
that they did not have the kind of staffing and the kind of facilities that we have today. Today, we have health facilities in all the villages. We have health workers who are being trained and who operate in all the villages. And in fact, for given clusters of health workers, for given clusters of health centers, we do have medics who have responsibilities. We have been able to extend the service that we provide and to improve those services so that in the areas of malaria treatment and microscopy, there has been tremendous improvement. And in fact, that is reflected in the fact that the morbidity and mortality rates have been declining for both of these. We have been able to reach out into the riverine areas with outreach programs so that we no longer sit and wait for people to come. We have a proactive approach which sees us reaching out into these various areas. Um, presently, laboratory and x-ray facilities have been established in the Mamaruma, in the Santo, in the Maruka, and in the Port Kaituma Hospital, so that a significant number of people can access those facilities. And may I also say that residents are able to benefit from some amount of surgery done in the region. Patients from all sub-regions are screened at the respective district hospitals, that is by the general practitioners, and then these are transferred to Mabuma, where there's scheduled surgical outreaches during the course of the year, including surgeries like gallstone, borneo, etc. My friends, added to this is the fact that the immunization program continues uh, and it continues to target more and more areas. But the fact is that more health care is being made available daily to a greater number of the population over a much wider spread. In addition, lots of resources have been put into linking communities, and that is by way of providing roads, improving on the roads that exist, Today, one can move from my room and go to Yarapita by road. Today, one can leave Santa Rosa and go to Cabana by road. Today, one can leave Port Kaitum and go to Barmito by road. Those are areas that were not accessible many years ago. Besides the roads, communication also. Communication by um, radio sets, communication by cellular phones, communication has improved tremendously. Recently, I was in the Maruka sub-region and was taken aback by the tremendous increase in the number of vehicles that traverse the roads in that sub-region in terms of minibuses and cars. And in the Maguruma sub-region, the same thing is replicated. People are able to move freely because of the improvement in transportation made possible because of the tremendous amount of resources that we have put into improving the roads that exist in region number one. In the area of other infrastructure, electricity, there has been a lot of improvements here not only in terms of electricity supplied by way of generator Maruma, at Port Kaituma, Matthews Bridge, and Santa Rosa, but also by way of solar energy. All the villages, all the title villages have access to solar. And it is always, I feel very happy going into those villages today and being able so all meetings with the people in the evenings, being able to converse with them, being able to dialogue with them because of the fact that we are able to stay up a little longer because of these facilities that are there. 
two lights. Computers. That's not a computer original. Computers. You just said it's your mother. Yeah, I have the geographic reference. Yeah, because the geographic reference is a nine wood telephone. Yes. The computers. Computer technology is now made available in a number of schools, in a number of homes, in a number of institutions. And very shortly, the Northwest Secondary School will be a part of ICT activity on the completion of that building. I want to deal finally with agriculture. Northwest was at one time the breadbasket of Guyana. I want to say that what has happened is not that the people have given up on agriculture. There has been diversification. There has been diversification. So that no longer do people merely cultivate ground provision. No longer is not just famous upon ground provision and ginger. But people have gone into other areas. People have gone into pineapples on a large scale because the Ankara company provides a market for pineapples. People have gone into craft culture. People have gone into lentils. People have gone into poultry rearing. This is because of the fact that mining activities, mining activities has resulted in a larger market, and so the demand is out there. This year, government has provided a significant amount of funds to continue the drainage and irrigation work in the Aruka and the Barima River in the areas. Mr. Speaker, scores of farmers will be benefiting from this important activity. Because those of you who are familiar with Region 1 and with the Aruba River and the Windy River will know that they are subject from time to time to periods of flooding. And so this investment in um, drainage in those river areas, one square mile in each of the two, will bring appreciable relief to the farmers in those areas. Mr. Speaker, the budgetary allocations provided by Budget 2013 and other budgets before them is a prime source of funding for regions like Region 1. And this allows them, the region, to provide more goods, to provide more services, and to provide more opportunities for the people in the region. Presently, those opportunities relate primarily to education, healthcare, agriculture, and infrastructural works. But we have seen increases over the years in terms of the amount made available, the amount of resources made available. And we have seen increases also in terms of the number of persons who can benefit from the resources made available. The people of Region 1 have therefore been able to improve the quality of their lives. And uh, I want to use this opportunity to thank our government for making this possible. Mr. Speaker, who will use and benefit from all the investment in people's development reflected in this budget? Who will use and benefit from them? Who will benefit from the let them to Linden Room? The Mile Falls project, electricity project, the Cato Secondary School with dorm facilities. Who will benefit from a new Demerara Harbor Bridge? Who will benefit from more investments in our public roads, including our four-lane highway? It is the Guyanese people, all of us, on this side and that side. The PBB 
BBC has slipped by its commitment to the Guyanese people. We are not saying that all is bad. We are not saying that we have achieved all that there is to be achieved or that we have obtained all the goals we have set ourselves. What we are saying is what I have emphasized before. We have made substantial progress. There is a verifiable plethora of examples and measures of achievement which I and other speakers before have adumbrated. Guyana, under the PPPC, is on an irreversible path to more progress and development. Every, every major business in Guyana has been showing a profit. Ask Mr. Yasu Passat from DDF. Ask them around the Ask Balsdiai, Mr. Speaker, I'm confident that when the 13th will see us continue along the path of the socio-economic growth and development we attained in 2012, with an even better performance in 2013, so that come local government or national elections, the Guyanese people will be happy to place those who continue to place obstacles in the path of our progress in the abyss of political history where they rightly belong.
had no input from the opposition. The majority, despite the calls made by the leader of the opposition, the Honorable David Granger, to His Excellency President Ramatar on December 12, 2011. Then again, on April 13, 2012, during the budget debate, the Honorable Member, Ms. Valda Lawrence, Mrs. Valda Lawrence, made another plea and even before the presentation of this budget, those calls have been reiterated. Three times now. There's a saying, comrade speaker, once is an incident, twice is a coincidence, but three times is downright disrespectful. Contemptuous, contemptuous comrade speaker, to the Constitution of Guyana, which clearly articulates in Article 13, citizen and their organization should be afforded opportunities to participate meaningfully in the decision-making processes of the state. Was this done? Contemptuous. Comrade Speaker, the people of this country spoke loudly through the ballot at the last general and regional elections. Comrade Speaker, had this government moved from, from their contemptuous ways, we would have seen a 2013 budget by the people, for the people, and for all the people who don't care. Comrade Speaker, the Honorable, Mem the Honorable Minister of Natural Resources, Robert Prasad, gave his account of former President Fox Burnham and Jagan's move to establish a government of national unity. Comrade Speaker, one wonders, was Minister Prasad present at the cabinet meeting after the results of the 2011 elections were declared? Because, Comrade Speaker, those results provided this country and the People's Progressive Party Civic with the greatest opportunity of bringing about a government of national unity. Instead of that, what did we get? I will be putting together a PPP government. So said now President Donald Ramtar. And we've seen just that. Throughout 2012 and even now in 2013, inclusivity is just a dream. Or maybe a nightmare, but you decide. Lose it takes all. So much for the budget theme, overcoming challenges together, accelerating gains for there. I take this opportunity to indicate that after thorough scrutiny of the rhetoric by the PPC government, I cannot support this budget in its entirety. I believe to do this, it would be a betrayal of the Guyanese populace who have entrusted me and every other legislator in this house with the inescapable responsibility of nation building and the insurance of a good life, not only for them, but for their children and their children's children. Comrade Speaker, I turn my attention to Region 2. Comrade Speaker, Region 2, as many may know, is dear to me, not only because it is the geographic constituency I represent, but also because I spent several years there as a child, and I take every opportunity to revisit my roots. Region 2, Comrade Speaker, is not without its share of challenges. There is great need for improvement in all sectors if those challenges are to be overcome. The problem of unemployment and underemployment, especially amongst youths, poor health facilities, poor health facilities, poor city fence, schools with inadequate facilities and teaching learning materials, problems in the agriculture sector, to name a few, are part of the plight of the residents of the Pamaroon Subanam region. Comrade Speaker, on August 23rd, 2012, the Essie Cripple Coast was in a state of unease as inmates of the New Opportunity Corps broke out of the facility. To quote Kaichur News of August 24, 2012, unrest turned nasty at NOC. Panic continues to grip the SC Cribble Coast as inmates of the New Opportunity Corps at New Opportunity Corps at On the Meaning intensify their rampage, setting fires to dormitory and other buildings in the compound last night. This was after dozens 
broke out from the facility on Wednesday. End of quote. Current speaker in his budget speech, the Honorable Minister of Youth, Sports and Culture, Dr. Frank Anton, under whom this facility falls, stated, and I quote, we continue to work with the children at NOC to give them the skills that will make a better life. End of quote. One line. Comrade Speaker, the Honorable Minister somehow conveniently neglected to provide this House with any plausible information as to the state of affairs at the NOC. In the said newspaper interview, the Honorable Minister is also quoted as saying, a commission of inquiry will be set up to examine the circumstances that led to the breakout and to make recommendations, end of quote. But even as we await the report of this inquiry, it is our hope that the questions, that these questions will be answered. One, why were armed ranks deployed at the Bondanemen location? Two, was it necessary for live rounds to be used? Three, did the police act in accordance with, the, with their standing operation procedures? Comrade Speaker, in February 6, 2013, publication of the Kaitro News, an article was carried under the caption NOC Commission of Inquiry. Final report is to be presented this month. End of quote. The article also quoted Minister of Culture, Youth and Sport, Dr. Frank Anthony, as stated his assurance that any staff were found guilty of abusing the children when the report is presented this month end will be dealt with accordingly. Comrade Speaker, this was February 6th. It is now Monday, April 8th, and we await the report. Perhaps, Comrade Speaker, the Honorable Minister, the Honorable Member, is wide awake in a dream while the inmates of the NOC are still living a nightmare. Correct me if I'm wrong, Comrade Speaker, but isn't the NOC a correctional institution? Which is the purpose, what is the purpose of the NOC? If not to provide opportunities for rehabilitation of those inmates, then what? Comrade Speaker, there are countless reports of former inmates of the NOC of abuse that they've, in, that they've endured during their time at the institution. What's even more alarming, Comrade Speaker, is the fact that the caregivers at the institutions are persons engaged in those abuse, abusive practices. To detract a bit from Region 2 and to come closer to home for a bit, we see similar practice of inmates at several correctional and care providing institutions. Places like the Palms Ger Geriatric Home, the Sophia Training Center, and the Drop In Center, just to name a few. Being abused by those individuals have been, who have been entrusted with the responsibility of ensuring that they are cared for and their rights are held and they are well taken care of. How much more must they endure? It is my humble recommendation, Comrade Speaker, that the relevant authorities take immediate action to correct those ills at the NOC and all other care given and rehabilitated institutions so as to ensure that the rights of all guidance, whether young or old, or differently able, are upheld. But yet still, Comrade Speaker, during that parliament, this house allocated over $100 million. The Market Target Basketball Initiative upgraded of community grounds unseen and unheard of. But Comrade Speaker, the Honorable Member Nick Kumar last year in his budget presentation assured me that he has a long list that he can make available to the Honorable Member. Comrade Speaker, to date I have not seen such a list. But yet we see in the 2013 budget there's a request for over $100 million for the upgrading of grounds. Unfulfilled promises. Unfulfilled promises. One such promise came from no other 
than former president, Dr. 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 the Honorable Champion of the Art Bar at Jack Deal, to members of the Golden Jaguars, Guyana's national football team. He said to them, and I quote, if you are successful at making the cuts, I will, I will ensure that house lots and other parks are available to you. To no avail, the Golden Jaguars are still waiting for us. Yeah. The other members say gaff, I say fluff. <laughs> Comrade Speaker, early in the year, I raised a question in this house of Guyana's national sports policy, after which I received this document, albeit at the cricket committee level. At the cricket committee level. No, 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 you see, Comrade, there's no need to go farther, you know. I'll explain in, in a short way. One member, you're right, because you did an exception. Thank you, Comrade Speaker. Well, As for its document, Comrade Speaker, that clearly outlines. Are you a uh, sport policy document of its people, of which I subsequently received, albeit at the committee, at the cricket administration committee level. And I have the document here. Comrade Speaker, we see on the front page it says here quite clearly a proposal. And this document was drafted, sir, in the year 2010. And when we turn the first page, Comrade Speaker, it says here, and I quote, this document represents the recommendations made by a consultant to the Minister of Culture, Youth, and Sport on actions required to modernize sports and physical activities over the next five years. Speaker, this document expires March 2014, and it has not seen the light of the why should we allocate monies to this ministry? Why should we allocate monies to this ministry? Fluff, Comrade Speaker. Comrade Speaker, in 2016, as all of us in this house are aware, the Olympics comes to the South America continent. I was hopeful and I was hoping, I was praying that when the Honorable Minister of Culture, Youth and Sports made his budget presentation, he would have been outlining to us in this house quite clearly Guyana's plans to ensure that we have persons participating in those Olympics, Comrade Speaker. Comrade Speaker, not a single word about the Olympics. And this, Comrade Speaker, as I mentioned earlier, shows us clearly that the Ministry of Culture, Youth and Sport does not have a plan for youth in this country. Yeah. Comrade Speaker, it is my humble suggestion that in speaking we refrain from referring to youths are the future. Lest we continue to think that only at a time hereafter and ignore the present needs and concern of our youths. Instead, let us in our speeches and actions say that youth mat youth matters and we must prepare them now to assume a leadership role in the not so distant future. In 2013 thus far, the single most outstanding individual in Guyana in the area of youth development, in my view, Comrade Speaker, is no other than the leader of the majority, the Honorable David Green. Comrade Speaker, since the genesis of this year, he has dedicated his efforts and the efforts of the parliamentary majority to the development of Guyana's youth. The honorable member has declared that 2013 be the year for youth. Comrade Speaker, the year for Guyana's youth. Focusing on areas of education, Employment and empowerment has made attempts for the Guyana's PPPC led government to do the same. The PPPC government, Comrade Speaker, 
blatantly disregard to accept this offer. It shows us clearly, it shows us clearly, Covered Speaker, where their priorities lie. What is the dream? What is the Guyana dream? I believe the fact to be true that a picture tells a thousand words. Covered Speaker, I know holding my hands, the budget presentation of the Honorable Minister of Finance. Got that, got that. Let's examine it, Comrade Speaker. There is an elderly man holding grains of rice in his hands. Like many Guyanese mothers, fathers, teachers, farmers, public servants, this picture seems to suggest, Comrade Speaker, the question, is this all? Come on, speaker, let's go to the left of that picture. Another gentleman holding, another gentleman holding sugar. He seems to be saying, after this government spent over 200 million US dollars on the Skeldon Sugar Factory, this is all that it produced. Covered speaker, a handful of sugar. A handful of sugar, covered speaker. Let's go above. Let's go above that picture. Let's go above. Look at the picture, covered. Let's go above. Or on the member you have. Okay. Let's go above to that picture, covered speaker. We see a lady, a young lady, representing thousands of guys who almost on a daily basis, she represents the average Guyanese unemployed public servants. Just a thing, Comrade Speaker, she's having her blood pressure checked. And indeed, Comrade Speaker, it should be noted that the fact that the Honorable Minister of Finance plays this bitch on the front page of the budget, he has clearly indicated that the 2013 budget is a pressure budget on the Guyanese. In conclusion, Comrade Speaker, since we are talking about youth and sport, Comrade Speaker, let us look at this 2013 budget presentation as a game of cricket. Let's look at this as cricket being played in the jungle. And Comrade Speaker, you are the umpire. Comrade Speaker, I call upon you to inform the Honorable Minister of Finance that the 2013 budget is a Comrade Speaker. I call upon you to ask the other members of this house to hold some inform the Minister of Finance that the budget is a no board and you will have to bat it here. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, 
soon after Mr. Quintage's intervention, I had cause to travel into the countryside where I met with some senior citizens Enough of the issue. 
and at a political level. Mr. Speaker, our differences seem to be more of a tactical and methodological rather than a strategic approach. We differ here and there on issues of methodology and tactics in respect to perspectives for the future of Canada. And it is not uncommon, Mr. Speaker, that in an emerging democracy, in most democracies that is, this is the norm. In addition, Mr. Speaker, in most democracies, charges about corruption, lack of inclusivity, is quite common. And Guyana is no exception. The point, however, Mr. Speaker, is that both government and opposition need to fight these social maladies, whether they are real or imagined. As a speaker, from a class perspective, the classes and social strata who the opposition represent are not dissimilar from the classes and social strata represented by the PDP. The strata certification of our country it's quite easily desirable and does not require any deep or profound analysis. The nature of the state, Mr. Speaker, that currently exists is one that depend, defends and represents the interests of all classes and social structure in our society. That is why we have patiently in the PPPC. That is why we have patiently and persistently worked to establish a national democratic state. This national democratic state, as I speak of, Mr. Speaker, is reflected in our country's consistent struggle for economic independence against the pitfalls of globalization and marginalization, existence of a broad, of the broad democratic rights and freedom of the people, and participation in policy making. Mr. Speaker, the PVP seat as a political party represents all social strata and classes in our society. The workers, the farmers, the progressive businessmen, progressive intellectuals, the military, and police men and women. The middle strata that we spoke so much about has a place in this national democratic state. And this budget, Mr. Speaker, is a good example that demonstrates that this is indeed the popular appeal by many. It's not an easy task. Mr. Speaker, I ask for all the answers to be sent to my office. <laughs> Over a period of time, it is because the records are not available. Mr. Speaker, I have with me here a record of the parliamentary debates of 1980. The Minister of Home Affairs at that time was the Honorable Mr. Stanley Moore. And in the course of that debate, Mr. Speaker, I was the parliamentary spokesperson for Home Affairs at the time, Mr. Clinton Collingwood. This is what he had to say. Quote, I would like to bring to the Minister's attention that robberies appear to be very prevalent. And according to the last year's report which you submitted to this assembly, it seems as though the vast majority of robberies are committed in urban areas. It means that the police force should be more equipped and more alert in urban areas. The figures show that 88.4% of robberies are committed in these urban areas. We also know and we acknowledge that the police have been doing something because we know that the bandits have shifted their base of operation to rural areas. 
Now, this tumor in its capacity as the Minister of Home Affairs. And this to say, it would be pure, and I'm quoting you, but it would be pure if, if it would be pure, it would be simplistic. It would be naive to assume that even with the most vigilant and resourceful police force in the world, we would eliminate traffic. As my friend on the other side is attempting to suggest, in the most wealthy countries in the world, the most powerful nations on earth, there is crime and the police can do no more than to contain crime to acceptable limits. Some of the rascals will always We went down to say, Mrs. that I quote, crime prevention committees do exist. There was one with the commission and I met on the west coast of Demar. And he went on to speak, I'll paraphrase what he said. He wanted to invite the people. And in this presentation, he's inviting the people at that time to form themselves into crime prevention committees to help the police fight crime. The police obviously sent their head to the speaker, could not do it alone. And there's not going to be any time when they can do it alone. So it wasn't that epoch, and so it will be in any other epoch. Mr. Speaker, I brought with me some newspapers. And in order to try to be objective, Mrs. Speaker, I brought not only the state on the honorable the speaker. I believe that the people of our country feel safe and secure because they did not have a feeling of safety and security. Whatever we fought for them, we hardly believe. I report to the Kaisho News of Sunday, February 24, where it reads 2013, another successful. Thousands of people leaving their homes 
that never in the history of the Ministry of Home talk about incompetence, call this incompetence, and I may call competent by something else. Never in the history of the Ministry of Home never in the history of the Guyana Police Force, the Guyana Prison Service, nor the Guyana Fire Service. Let me quickly say, Mr. Felix, Mr. Speaker, the Honorable Member, spoke about the Guyana Fire Service. The Honorable Member sought to insert or to create division between the Guyana Police Force and community policing when he said that we are purchasing more and more vehicles for community police to the disadvantage of the Guyana Police Force. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, we have indeed been procured vehicles and equipment for the community police. But by no stretch of imagination, unless we want to make political propaganda, but the political propaganda, Mr. Speaker, will fall on its face because the facts attest differently. Because when we look at the money spent for the procurement of police vehicles over the years, Mr. Speaker, I think it is fair game for me to refer to the report that was published by the CEO. If the other government of Belgium could seek refuge in that report, exonerating himself and his party from that matter, I believe, Mr. Speaker, that in all fairness and honesty, I should refer to the COI report, exonerating from that issue. So, Speaker, this was a proper commission. Then came the allegation or the attempt to stop me from speaking in this national assembly. Mm -hmm. Mr. Speaker, the court pronounced on this matter. Time is of the essence. The court pronounced on the matter. The Speaker of the National Assembly pronounced on Mr. Speaker, this is the first, but debate that is taking place since those sort of occasions. I wish to rest my case, Mr. Speaker. I simply to say the court from I think it was in an Indian movie called Shole, which is associated with the celebration of power, where one friend tells the other, if you want to be an honorable man, you have to pay a price. That price, I am prepared to pay. Thank you.